All right. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, happy Wednesday, because I'm told it is Wednesday. And Wednesday is always a happy day because we're getting closer to the weekend. Let's see what I can say here. Uh, all right. Um, good afternoon. Uh, I'll start today with an update on Mali. Uh, as you can well imagine, the Secretary General is continuing to follow the developments in Mali very closely and with deep concern. The Security Council, as you may have heard, uh, will be meeting this afternoon in closed session uh, to discuss the situation there. They will be briefed by Jean-Pierre Lacroix, uh, the head of peace operations here at the UN. And as you can imagine, the mission in the country is also uh, following the situation and closely monitoring the developments. Our colleagues on the ground are emphasizing that the work of the UN peacekeeping mission must and will continue in support of the people of Mali and in close liaison with the Malians, including with the Malian security and defense forces in the north and center, where the situation is still very worrying. In his statement that yesterday, the Secretary General strongly condemned the military mutiny, which culminated in the arrest of President uh, Keita and members of his government. Uh, the Secretary General calls for an immediate restoration of constitutional order and rule of law in Mali. He reiterates his call for a negotiated solution, peaceful resolution of their differences, and expresses his full support for the African Union, ECOWAS, in their efforts to find a peaceful solution to the current crisis, including through the good offices of his special representative. He urges all stakeholders, particularly the defense and security forces, to exercise maximum restraint and uphold the human rights and individual freedoms of all Malians. And today, as you know, is World Humanitarian Day. August 19th was chosen as World Humanitarian Day because on that day in 2003, 22 UN staff were murdered in Baghdad in a terrorist attack on the UN headquarters of the Canal Hotel. Today, we warn that we, excuse me, today we mourn them and honor our brave colleagues who survived. So many of them quietly return to work and continue to serve humanity to this day. In his message, the Secretary General said that humanitarian health workers and first responders are the unsung heroes of the COVID-19 response, often risking their own lives to save others. And he calls on the international community to join him in thanking them for their work, solidarity, and humanity in this time of unprecedented need. Last year was the most violent on record for humanitarians, with 483 aid workers attacked, including 125 killed, in 277 separate incidents. And our colleagues from OCHA invite you to look at the worldhumanitariandaid.org website and on social media, where stories of these brave frontline workers are being shared. Speaking this morning at the opening of the Interparliamentary Union uh, Conference of Speakers of Parliament, the Secretary General addressed the broad impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. He urged parliamentarians to, re to turn to recovery in, to, excuse me, to turn the recovery in a real, uh, into a real opportunity to do things right for the future. On the climate, the Secretary General said that as the world recovers from COVID-19, it is a, quote, make or break moment, end quote, for the health of our planet. And turning to the, our friends in the Security Council, today the ambassadors met in an open meeting on Syria. They were briefed by the Secretary General Special Envoy, Pierre Peterson, and said that preparations are being made to convene the third session of the small body of the Syrian-owned, Syrian-led, UN-facilitated Constitutional Committee in Geneva. There has been a nine-month hiatus due to differences over the agenda and then the COVID-19 restrictions. Mr. Pedersen said that establishing a foundational act, a social contract for Syrians, after a decade of conflict and its deep divisions and mistrust is a momentous task. The special envoy stressed that the need for complete, immediate nationwide ceasefire to enable an all-out effort to combat the pandemic. And um, in turning to Yemen, uh, the humanitarian coordinator for the country, Lise Grande, warns that half of all UN's major programs in the countries are currently impacted by lack of funding. Already, 12 of the UN's 38 major programs have been shut down or drastically scaled back. Between August and September, 20 programs face further uh, reductions or closure. Ms. Grande noted that World Humanitarian Day should be a day of celebration, 
that this year in Yemen, because, excuse me, that this year in Yemen, it's the opposite. In April, food rations for more than 8 million people in northern Yemen were halved. Health services were cut or reduced in 275 specialized centers treating people with cholera and other infectious diseases. Allowances to nearly 10,000 frontline health workers were stopped. If funding is not urgently received in the coming weeks, half of water and sanitation services will be cut. Medicines, essential supplies for 189 hospitals and 2,500 primary health care clinics, representing half of the health facilities in the country, will halt. Thousands of children who are suffering from both malnutrition and disease could die. At least 70% of schools will likely be shut and only barely able to function when the new school year starts in the coming weeks. Tens of thousands of displaced people who have nowhere else to go will be forced to live in inhumane conditions. <clears throat> At the high level of pledging event for Yemen in, in Riyadh on June 2nd, donors pledged $1.35 billion of the $2.41 billion that is needed to cover essential uh, service, essential humanitarian activities until the end of the year. That leaves a gap of more than a billion dollars. Yemen remains the world's worst humanitarian crisis. Nearly 80% of the population, more than 24 million people, require some form of humanitarian aid and protection. Turning to Lebanon, our humanitarian colleagues there tell us that the Beirut port is temporarily operational. Nearly 9,000 containers were unloaded at the port between August 11th and yesterday. More than 1,000 tons of goods, including iron, wheat, have been imported through the port. We, along with our partners, are continuing to provide emergency humanitarian assistance and conduct, ass conduct assessments. UN Women has received dozens of calls on a dedicated safe phone lines for women and girls at risk who are experiencing gender-based violence in areas impacted by explosions. UN Women and our partners and its partners, excuse me, are also carrying out gender assessments later this month. Since the day after the explosion, the UN Refugee Agency uh, health helpline has received more than 6,000 calls with more than 500 direct referrals for refugees in need of assistance. UNHCR is providing psychosocial support, emergency health cash, shelter kits, and follow-up on any issues related to child protection and gender-based violence. Access to water is another critical issue in uh, Beirut with more than 680 households in need of water tanks. Water is being trucked in and some buildings have been reconnected to the water supply. Although the government announced a two-week lockdown due to the COVID-19 from the 21st of August to September 6th, all relief and aid workers, aid work in the aftermath of the Beirut explosion will be allowed to continue. Turning to Libya, <clears throat> earlier today, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michel Bachelet, appointed members of the independent fact-finding mission on Libya. They are uh, Mohamed Ajwar of Morocco, Tracy Robinson of Jamaica, and Shaloka Bayani of Zambia, and the United Kingdom. The fact-finding mission was established by the Human Rights Council in June to document alleged human rights violations and abuses of international human rights and international humanitarian law committed by all parties in Libya since 2016. Especially said the deterioration of the security situation in the country, as well as the absence of a functioning judicial system, underscored the importance of the work of the team of independent experts. They will serve as an essential mechanism to address the widespread impunity for human rights and violations of uses committed, especially went on to say. The independent fact-finding mission on Libya will provide an oral update at the Human Rights Council later in September. A comprehensive written report will follow next year. And an update for you on what we are doing in Madagascar to address the COVID-19 pandemic. There are more than 13,800 confirmed cases of the virus and 171 deaths in that country. The UN team, led by the acting resident coordinator, Charlotte Fatih Njai, is supporting the government on all fronts, including on health and socioeconomic responses. UN agencies have provided nearly a million dollars worth of protective lab and medical equipment to boost local testing and treatment capacity. Tens of thousands of these items have been, uh, excuse me, tens of thousands of these items have been sent to testing centers across Madagascar. The World Health Organization is also providing risk communications training and technical advice to local community workers and first responders. WHO is continuing its existing vaccination campaign against other infectious diseases. 
And speaking of donations, our peacekeeping colleagues tell us that last week the UN received a donation of 5,000 nasal swabs from Copan Italia, a company based in Mantua in Italy. As you know, swabs are used to collect samples and are critical for COVID-19 testing. The swabs were received by the UN's Global Service Center in Brindisi and will be distributed to our field offices to test our staff. This donation is an example of the partnership between the private sector and the UN to help us carry out our operations safely. And in response to questions, a uh, question I received I can, on um, the situation in Burkina Faso, I can tell you that the Secretary General condemns the assassination last week of El Hajj Sisse, the Grand Imam and President of the Muslim community of Jibo in the Sum province of Burkina Faso. He had been kidnapped by still unidentified men in, in August. The Secretary General, uh, on August 11th, excuse me, the Secretary General expresses deepest condolences to his families and the government of people of Burkina Faso. The assassination of the Grand Imam is a part of an increasingly worrying trend of targeted assassinations of moderate community and religious leaders over the past months in Burkina Faso in a vile but vain attempt to intimidate and subdue the population. He calls on the Burkina the Secretary General calls on the Burkina Bay authorities to spare no effort in identifying and swiftly bringing the perpetrators to justice in this heinous crime, uh, in this, of this heinous crime. He also reiterates the commitment of the UN to intensify support of Burkina Faso in its efforts to create the conditions for sustainable peace and development. Uh, those are all the words and I was able to share with you proactively. I can uh, probably share some more if you ask the right questions. Uh, um, so let's go to the chat and see who uh, wants to raise uh, first. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Pamela Falk, please. Hi, Hi, Seth. I hope this is one of those right questions. Um, my question is about the Secretary General possibly meeting with Secretary of State Mike Pompeo tomorrow. Can you tell us about it? What time will there be a readout and if it will occur? Thanks. Uh, as far as I know, yes, it will occur tomorrow afternoon. Um, the Secretary General will meet the Secretary of State at uh, the Secretary General's uh, residence. Uh, as far as a readout, we'll see what uh, we can uh, get out after the meeting. An estimated time, please? Uh, I, you know, I don't have it off the top of my head. It's like mid-afternoon, probably around 2 o'clock. Two, 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 did you say? Sorry? Sorry, around 2 or 3, did you say? I said around 2 o'clock, but I will oh. talk to you a little later. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Toby uh, Burns, have you been able to connect? Okay. Uh, I'll come back to you if you can't connect. Um, Sato-san, please. Yes. Uh, thank you, Stefan. Yes, uh, it seemed to me that uh, Toby jumped in the uh, question with text message, the same question to you, that uh, regarding uh, Mali. So mm -hmm. uh, we recall the uh, the same similar coup d'etat uh, in uh, 2000. 12, uh, which led to the uh, uh, Al Qaeda rampant uh, in that region. So, how much does Secretary General concern about these kind of the political vacuum uh, will lead to the uh, some uh, such a terrorist uh, attack and the terrorist uh, activity? Look, we're, we're obviously uh, concerned. The Secretary General was very clear in his condemnation of this uh, military, of this mutiny. Uh, instability uh, is the last thing that Mali uh, needs. And that's why we need to see quickly a return uh, to the constitutional order. Uh, I mean, as we've been reporting, and, be, and that's why the mission is there, there's, there are major uh, security issues uh, in Mali, which the, the mission is, is working, is, is working to, to help the country with. Um, the Malian people uh, need stability in their governance and they need stability in their country. Okay, uh, Benno. 
Yes, thanks so much. I hope you're fine, Steph. Um, I am, thank you. A small technical question about Mr. Lacroix's briefing later on Mali. Will it be will it made uh, available to us or it's, not? In, it's in closed? Uh, it's 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 closed. Uh, we'll see what we can do on uh, regarding your question. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, Edie, please. Uh, thank you, Steph. Uh, a follow-up question on Mali. Um, since this obviously involves the military in Mali that the UN peacekeepers work very closely with, um, I think all of us would appreciate some more detailed thinking on who was involved, who might be leading, what the UN assessment is of the coup cool leaders. So I, I think the, 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 the situation is, is ex continues to be very fluid. Uh, our colleagues on the ground are talking to, as, as I mentioned, are remaining in contact with uh, their operational partners in the north and in the center uh, on the security and the military front. We are speaking with whoever we have to, to we need to speak to to do our work uh, in Bamako. Uh, you know, go, going back to what I said to to Sato-san, the situation is very unstable. It remains very fluid, and that's why the, the earliest we can return to a constitutional order with clarity, uh, the better it will be. Most importantly for the Malian people, but obviously for the work of the of the mission. Um, I also have. A question about the latest situation in Belarus. Uh -huh. um, the president is standing firm. The European Union today said they did not recognize the results of the election. Um, is that a position that the United Nations also takes. I mean, the EU didn't have observers there either, and they've made a, an assessment. Look, uh, I, I think the, 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 the Council of, of, uh, of the EU is slightly different than the, the Secretary General in their remit and their, and their political space. But th that, that being said, uh, I think we're very concerned uh, by what we've heard, these latest reports of possible renewed restrictions on peaceful uh, protests and peaceful gatherings. Uh, I think it's, it's critical that uh, the authorities in Belarus fully respect the rights of all Belarusians to express peacefully their views um, and to refrain from using force. Uh, there are clearly issues uh, emanating from the, uh, from the elections uh, on August 9th. Um, those issues need to be addressed through dialogue. They need to respect the democratic process and the rule of law. And we're going to continue to follow uh, the situation uh, with great, with, with very carefully. All right. Um, Abdel Hamid. Thank you, Stefan. <clears throat> Going back to the agreement between the three leaders, which is Netanyahu, Trump, and MBZ, and three of them having trouble at home including MBZ, who failed miserably in Libya, Yemen, Turkey, and others. And as we see the reaction in the region, today Saudi Arabia confirmed its commitment to the peace, uh, the Arab Peace Initiative. Sudan fired the spokesman who welcomed the talks with Israel. Uh, Oman fired the foreign minister. Not one country welcomed that, except Bahrain, officially. Don't you think the SG was rushing into welcoming an agreement between the three leaders while seeing today the Palestinians in Gaza and West Bank demonstrating in thousands against this agreement? Would he rather see himself next to the people or next to these hated, locally hated leaders? Thank you. The, the, the Secretary General, if, if, to answer your last question, the Secretary, Secretary General uh is is seizing in his in his statement i think sees what he saw as an opportunity uh to move uh the process forward and to put uh, to put a halt uh to to the annexation and i think we have, we have nothing 
to go back to in the statement or, or nothing to change. But Stefan, the statement uh, has, uh, the agreement has nothing to do with the annexation, completely. I mean, both Israel and United Arab Emirates retreated from the early statement that has to do with annexation. Again, uh, I, I, listen, I, I will leave the analysts and the journalists to analyze and, and report on uh, what I can tell you is our, our position uh, remains uh, remains unchanged, and we see this as, a, as an opportunity and hope uh, that the people and the leaders will seize it. Uh, Iftikhar, I think you had a question. Uh, thank you, Steph. Uh, last week, the United Nations made an appeal uh, for over six hundred million dollars to help the situation, grave situation in Beirut. Uh, what has been the response and, how, I mean, how much it has been funded? Uh, in terms of Lebanon, I will tell you in two seconds. Uh, uh, I, I apologize for this. Um, uh, I think for, $41.2 uh, million dollars uh, has been uh, has been received. Uh, this was uh, this was as of a couple of as of yesterday. But I will. Um, uh, so there was yeah there was a. I will give listen, I, I, instead of uh, trying to make up numbers here. Uh, I will give you. Uh, we'll send an update around very shortly. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, any more questions? Uh, Dulce was asking, uh, when is a military mutiny called a coup? Thanks. Okay. I mean, we've uh, you know, whether you call it a military mutiny or a coup, uh, the point is that it is an effort to change the constitutional order uh, through the force of arms, and that is something we can do uh, very directly. All right. Can Can I ask a follow up, please? Over here. Yes. So why are you not calling it a coup? Is there a legal reason? No, there's no legal reason. This was a language used, you know, at the time in the afternoon when uh, uh, the situation was what it was. Uh, but I would not uh, overanalyze it or read too much into it. So you would call it a coup as well? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a change. It's a, you can call it a coup, a military mutiny. It's a it's a it's a change of. Uh, of government uh, that is an unco inco unconstitutionally through the force of arms. And that's why we're calling for a return to the constitutional order. Okay, thanks. All right, uh, anybody else? Stefan, it's Ben, do you hear me? Oh, Ben, I, I hear you. Uh, uh, quick, quick question. Uh, yep. Tomorrow afternoon, will UNTV be offering an, a photo op of the meeting with the SG? No, unfortunately not. As you know, the, the Secretary General uh, is in the last days of his quarantine to follow the uh, public health regulations of uh, the city uh, and the country where, we, where he resides. Uh, so we are limiting uh, to the bare minimum, uh, which means basically the participants, uh, the meeting. Uh, if we can, if we can squeeze a, a photo from somebody's iPhone, I will send it to you. Um, but that's uh, given the, the the pandemic situation. That's unfortunately where where we are. Okay. Uh, and just uh, follow up on the actual snapback. Does the SG agree that based on the reading of the resolution two two three one, the US has the legal right to trigger snapback? That is the decision and a comment for member states to make. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, just uh, the meeting with Pompeo and the Secretary General. Is this where Pompeo will hand the letter to? Uh, uh, you, they, the, the U.S. requested the meeting. I think. Okay. Uh, the Pompeo, re what the Secretary of State will will do. I think that is uh, something you have to ask the U.S. mission. Uh, Steph, Steph, Pam, uh, yes, just wanted to follow up. Maybe I missed it on the Secretary General's quarantine. Could you just lay out why? Uh, because he was in, uh, he went home for uh, for two weeks to Portugal, uh, and as a precautionary measure, and to direct uh, the um, the public health regulations and recommendations of the city, the state of New York, uh, he has uh, left his residence. Uh, we are limited, as I said, to the bare minimum uh, contact with anyone from from the outside, and that will end 
Uh, I think today. Thank you. And there's no press, there's no photo op, but there will be a readout? There will be no photo op, uh, and whether or not there will be a readout is not something I'm able to promise, at least from our side. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, Steph, may I just jump in because I find it interesting. Isn't the Secretary General an essential worker and therefore he doesn't have to quarantine? Uh, you know, for the Secretary General, uh, I mean, he, he he's not an essential worker in the terms that he's a doctor or a nurse uh, or doing, I mean, he is, of course, doing essential work. Um, but the point is that he can do this essential work from his residence. It's all wired up. Uh, so he's conducting all his meetings uh, by Zoom and so forth. And, you know, it, and even uh, without the quarantine, he has been limiting his exposure, not going into the office every day um, as a precautionary measure to himself and to uh, the staff. But the, the while not being an essential worker, the essential work that he does uh, continues uh, from, from the residents unabated. Okay, anybody else? Okay, uh, on that little excitement, uh, we shall see you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye.